Um, just want to welcome our, our webinar audience today, just so that you know we are broadcasting this uh, via webinar. Uh, so far we have over 160 people online uh, and 300 actually signed up. Uh, so we'll probably uh, have people join as we are going along today. Uh, also uh, want to welcome everyone in the audience. We certainly appreciate your participation. Uh, it's part of the technical guidance training series and your participation uh, is really what makes this, uh, these events, I think, more meaningful and useful to uh, uh, the regulated community as well as DEP staff, especially when it comes to the questions and answers part. Uh, I would ask you if you could uh, to remember to, I think I will too because I always forget this, to silence your cell phones. Uh, it's just very distracting uh, for the uh, presentation presenters as well as the audience. I had to make sure mine was done. I made that announcement once and then mine went off. It's kind of embarrassing. Uh, the other thing is just to give you some logistics, the location of the restrooms uh, out the door. Uh, there's a set of restrooms uh, to the left as well as across the uh, foyer. Uh, there's another set through the double doors on your left and as well as the cafeteria when we uh, hit the brakes. Uh, the uh, cafeteria is all the way down at the end uh, if you want to get some refreshments. Um, the questions and answers today. Uh, because of the webinar audience, I just wanted to make sure everyone understands uh, when we do ask questions, Please wait for one of us to uh, run around with uh, the microphone. Uh, Kathy Coons is right here. She will be a mic jockey as well as myself. Uh, but it's very important for uh, everyone in the audience here today as well as the web audience to hear the question uh, before the uh, presenters answer it. Uh, so that's very important. There will be two question and answer periods. We ask you to hold your questions for that uh, point of time. Uh, the first one will be right before the uh, break. Uh, 305 to 320. We have uh, questions and answers and also at the very end we will also have another session. Um, just to let you know if there's any questions that are not answered in that time frame, uh, if we're short on time, uh, please uh, make sure to email those questions to the presenters. Uh, they are obligated to get you answers. As far as the web audience, the web audience uh, submits them uh, online and we do track uh, contact information for the person who submitted them and the presenters uh, will make sure to get you answers. Uh, so we're, uh, we're committed to, to making sure that questions are answered. But uh, I think the most valuable part really is the, the, the exchange and the, the talking uh, between the presenters and the audience uh, today. So hopefully we'll have time for questions, adequate time for questions. Uh, the other thing I would like to uh, emphasize is the uh, evaluation form. Uh, there's one in everyone's packet. Uh, typically out of 100 in the room, sometimes we get 10 responses on that. I'm up here to encourage you to please uh, increase that number of responses. It really helps us improve this uh, program that we do, helps uh, presenters um, uh, gauge how effective they were in presenting the information uh, as well as gives us ideas on timing and, and venue uh, information as well. Uh, want to uh, thank today's presenters. Uh, today we have uh, Bill Hanrahan uh, from the DEP. Uh, he's with the uh, Bureau of Environmental Measurements and Site Assessment. Uh, we have Christina Page from DEP. She's a Bureau of Inspection and Reviews. Uh, we have Jeff, Jeff Farrell uh, from Paulus Sok Sokolowski and Santor LLC. Uh, we have uh, Tom O'Brien from Active Environmental Technologies. Uh, we have Andrew Mikowski from Mikowski & Associates. And we also have uh, Mark Souders uh, from NJDEP. He's with the Bureau of Operations, Maintenance, and Monitoring. I uh, also would like to thank uh, the training committee, which really works hard to put these events on. Uh, the person who's in charge of the training committee is Karen Riccardi. She just had to step out. Uh, but there's also uh, Tessie Fields participates, Karen Clue, uh, Kathy Katz, Sue Shannon, uh, Joe Eaker, who's working our webinar today. Uh, Veronica Peppers and Kathy Coons, who's being the mic jockey today. So uh, it takes a lot of effort to put these things on and to make them um, uh, viable, and we certainly appreciate everyone's effort in that regard. Uh, today I'd like to uh, actually introduce um, our first uh, speaker who's up today. I forgot to thank you, Dan. I'm sorry. And <laughs> that is uh, Dan Toder, who's a vice president at uh, Hatchmott McDonald. Uh, he's also the director of community outreach for the LSRPA. Uh, Dan's going to give us an overview on the uh, LSRPA. So, Dan, come on up here, Dan. Thanks, George. Uh, good afternoon to you all. Good afternoon to the people on the webinar as well. Uh, and welcome to the Groundwater Cy Rai Ray session. I came all the way to Trenton to say that. And now I can go home. Um, Next slide, please. Uh, I'd like to thank our sponsors. We've had how many of these now? 13 or 14 of them? 
And uh, every time our sponsors have provided refreshments, coffee, donuts, pretzels, and whatever, I'd like to thank them right now. I always do this at the beginning of the session. Accutest Laboratories, Alpha Laboratories, AWT Environmental, Borbus Surveying, East Coast Drilling, EST Associates, Hampton Clark Veritech Laboratories, and Riker Danzig Attorneys at Law. Thank you very much to those sponsors. Uh, next slide. Thank you. Um, all the LSRPs in the room and out on the webinar are painfully aware that we have a test coming up. May 14th is the date. And uh, we're going to have uh, three tests uh, into the future. One will be September, I believe, the next in November, and then the last one that will be scheduled is will be in January. And as everybody knows, uh, the LSRPs have to pass the test to get their permanent license. To help them pass the test, the LSRPA has created a course, a review course, so that they can prepare for the exam. It's coming up quickly. It's on Monday. The first one is on Monday. We're going to get our feet wet with this one. This is the first class we're putting on in preparation for the exam. It's on the 16th, and it is at Bergen County Community College. I hear that that is filled now. Uh, however, the second one on April 25th at Burlington County Community College, I believe still have some spots open. So if you haven't signed up, you're going to have to go to the Burlington site and take the course there. Next slide, please. This is an outline of the class, if you're going to come to the class. Uh, this is uh, the agenda. We're going to take it through the remedial process, essentially, site remediation process. We're going to start off with some regulatory questions. It's all going to be question-based. Each speaker that you see on the board there is going to have about 15 or 20 questions they're going to pose to the audience. So we're going to get you into the testing mode. And um, we're going to go over questions and answers on each of these categories here. We're going to start with regulatory. We're going to cover some technical concepts, uh, geology of New Jersey, hydrogeology, Darcy's Law, things like that. Uh, the inf information gathering phase, the PSI fa PASI phase uh, with Kathy Stetzer and uh, general site issues. Mike Poland and Mark Fisher are going to do that session. And we're going to continue with VI and IECs and remedial investigation. And then we're going to hit remedial action and case closure. So it takes us through the process of site remediation. We felt that that was the best way to uh, conduct the course. And believe me, nobody that's involved with the course knows what's on the test. A lot of people think we have the inside track to these questions and things. We are totally making a guess as to what could be on the test, or at least touching upon what could be on the test. And if anything, it will make you aware of where your weaknesses are and what you have to study. So that's really the basic purpose of the class, is to, is to give you an awareness of what you need to work on before the test. So I hope you enjoy it when you when you attend, and uh, hopefully there's not too many bugs in the first one. Our membership increased about 20% just when that course was advertised because we, we uh, allowed a large discount on the fee for it. So everybody signed up. So everybody who wasn't a member before who became a member, thank you very much for joining. Um, a, lot of, a lot of opportunities for you, a lot of people to meet. Uh, and you save money. So uh, if you haven't joined, you should, especially if you're an LSRP. And the next slide tells you how to join. And thank you very much. Enjoy the session. And for all you LSRPs out there, including myself, good luck on the test. And take my course. Thanks. Great. Thank you very much, Dan. Uh, next, uh, what I wanted to do is just give a brief uh, overview of uh, technical guidance, uh, how the department has uh, uh, run the committees, uh, and just give you uh, a feel for what we're presenting on today, how that technical guidance is developed. 
Um, basically, the, the technical guidance committees uh, are composed of two to three DEB staff and from three to seven uh, outside stakeholders, really depending upon the complexity of the subject. Uh, the the um, members of the committee were really selected to create a balance of technical expertise, uh, practical application, and regulatory knowledge. And I think to uh, predominantly almost every committee, I think, has had a, an excellent, um, I guess, uh, an excellent group of, of people that represented all of those. And it, it's been very effective. Uh, the tasks they were really given was to design guidance, uh, develop guidance, uh, make that as balanced as possible from all the different perspectives that are brought to the table and also to develop training on the guidance, and that's why we're here today. So we certainly thank uh, the committee. Uh, and the other thing is that uh, when will the documents be revised? Well, they will be revised uh, in uh, response to changes in regulatory policy, regulatory um, or regulations, uh, and also changes or updates in technology. Uh, and that's really going to be handled by um, the committee chairs. We'll make the decisions whether they believe that uh, updates are, are necessary. Uh, and if they're uh, absolutely necessary in terms of technical um, uh, technical updates, uh, then they may at that point decide to bring the uh, the committees back together again uh, and make the other decisions similar to the, the process that was already done. Uh, so the review process for the technical documents. Uh, in the very beginning of the whole process, we realized that a, a, a robust uh, technical review process was very important uh, to increase the, the quality of the documents. Uh, we need really to balance, though, the need for good feedback uh, with the ability of the documents to actually get um, uh, written. One problem is if, if we had uh, extended the technical documents out for review to such a large uh, number of people that the, the number of responses and comments that we got back were difficult to address in a timely manner, the documents never would have uh, been issued. An example of that is the vapor intrusion document, which had over well close to 800 comments. Uh, and it took them a really long time to get that done. We commit um, each uh, technical guidance uh, committee uh, has a responsibility to issue a response to comments. For all the technical comments, they issue those documents. They're all posted on the website with the document. Uh, so if you did uh, issue a, a comment and you were wondering what the response to that comment was, you can check that out. Um, so uh, what we did to achieve that balance uh, between we had uh, a six-week review time frame uh, we issued those documents for review to internally to uh, DEP senior management, uh, SRP uh, senior management as well. That's bureau chiefs, assistant directors, uh, and also to the assistant commissioner's office. Um, we also uh, afforded all SRP uh, staff the ability to uh, request review of those documents, and uh, a lot of them actually did. And I think it improved the, the quality of the documents. Uh, from a stakeholder perspective, we had the stakeholders from every uh, one of the stakeholders on each committee received a copy of the document. Uh, they were asked to review that document and if they represented a particular constituency to conduct uh, a review and coordinate a review within, within their constituencies and then return those comments back and funnel them back to the committee chair. Uh, and that was very effective. Uh, as a third um, aspect of it, we utilized the uh, SRP steering committee. Uh, we had them review the documents in terms of identifying a fatal flaw, something that was seriously wrong with the document that they felt uh, would preclude that document from being used within the regulated community, uh, and that has also been effective. Uh, and we, all these uh, comments are funneled back to the committee chairs um, who address those comments and put them in the responses. These are the, uh, just a list of the documents that have been uh, posted so far, uh, finalized and posted. Uh, there's actually uh, 15 documents. Uh, they are all available uh, at the website on the bottom, which is the DEP SRP guidance uh, library. Um, the ones that have not been issued, uh, the soil underground storage tank document should probably be issued this week. Uh, technical and practicability uh, document has been issued uh, for comment. I think that comment period closes on April 24th. The attainment document has been issued also for draft review. Um, that comment period, I believe, closes on May 16th. Uh, and the analytical methods document is being worked on and has not been issued draft yet. Uh, this is just a, a list of training uh, currently. There's a, today's training up there for April 10th. We also have the Soils Site Investigation, Remedial Investigation, and Remedial Action, which is on uh, Friday, May 4th. And also the Soils Underground Storage Tanks and Landfills uh, documents will be uh, holding a training session on Tuesday, April 24th. This is just a, uh, to let you know in existing, tech guide, or existing technical requirements for site remediation, the tech regs, 
uh, it treated variance from rule as well as uh, deviation from guidance in the same manner. Uh, that's kind of inconsistent with the Site Remediation Reform Act, or ARCS, the Administrative Requirements for the Remediation of Contaminated Sites. Uh, so in order to identify how the department will handle uh, variance from rule as well as uh, deviation from guidance or use of alternate approaches, uh, we issued this particular document. Um, it really is just to identify how the, the department is, is going to handle that with the idea that it will certainly allow for the use of professional judgment uh, and variance from rule uh, is significantly different than uh, use of alternate uh, guidance. So this is pretty much uh, following up on that, is that the DEP's technical guidance um, certainly allows for the use of professional judgment. I think that has been one aspect that's been very important and driven home in almost all of the training uh, uh, classes that we do. Um, it's uh, allowed if there's no DEP guidance or the guidance is considered inappropriate or unnecessary in the professional opinion of the LSRP. Uh, however, the LSRP is obligated to explain why a different approach was used and why it is still protective um, uh, in its use. Uh, Again, the complexity of the explanations are relative to the complexity of site conditions. One thing that we, we certainly appreciate from the regulated community, as well as even DEP staff, is feedback, uh, both on uh, how the document is, is used, the usability of the document, uh, problems that may be encountered that we may have the ability to fix, such as slight updates to the document or posting of, of notes uh, on the SRP guidance library. Um, the other thing is, we, we have the ability to uh, start new um, technical guidance committees uh, if need be. And the way we would do that is we would look to, uh, to obtain feedback through this mechanism on other topics that perhaps would be valuable uh, for the regulated community, even DEP staff, if they see an issue uh, that is unclear that we need uh, guidance. Um, uh, we would certainly take that into consideration through this uh, venue. Uh, the other thing is um, if there are uh, technology updates, if people in the field are, find that there's, there's different applications that are certainly more effective than what we may have in our guidance, we would like to know about that. And so we would encourage you to let us know about that through this, this feedback. Um, this, uh, the feedback um, mechanism does allow feedback for, for many topics. So we would ask you, if you do that, please make sure that you identify uh, you know, what the issue is, the topic. Uh, if it's a particular guidance document, make sure you mention that, and then let us know uh, what your question or, or comments are. Uh, that's it. We actually don't have time for any questions, but if during the, the first uh, question and answer period, if you do have questions, feel free to ask me. Uh, in addition to that, um, our contact information is provided, uh, and feel free to, uh, to email myself or any of the other presenters if you have questions. So with that, I would like to introduce uh, Bill Hanrahan. Uh, Bill has been the chairperson for the Groundwater Committee and done an excellent job, and he's here to, to kick off our training. So Bill? Thanks, George. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank the people who helped write this document. And if you could just stand up when I say your name. Julian Davies, Sovereign. Andrew Mikowski, Mikowski and Associates. Jeff Farrell of um, PSNS. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Tom O'Brien of Active Environmental. And several DEP people. Christina Page is here. Joel Friedell is here, and Mark Souders. Oh, and Eric Kinzel. There you are. <laughs> I love public speaking. OK. <clears throat> Am I supposed to do this? Do I know how to do this? OK, the groundwater technical guidance document provides direction on performing a groundwater site investigation, <clears throat> performing a background groundwater quality investigation, the identification and delineation of NAPL and sources of groundwater contamination, performing a remedial investigation in both the unconsolidated and bedrock aquifers, and the installation of a groundwater monitoring network to evaluate performance of the groundwater remedial action. <clears throat> In order to conduct the remediation efficiently, the guidance recommends establishing an initial conceptual model of site hydrogeology and contaminant transport and updating the model as data are acquired. The use of direct push methods to collect groundwater grab samples may be, that may be analyzed in the field, 
Field screening methods such as the membrane interface probe or the uh, laser induced fluorescence to determine the location of sources and groundwater contamination in detail. And in bedrock aquifers, the guidance recommends first establishing a hydrogeologic framework using test boreholes, borehole geophysical techniques, and flow testing prior to attempting to delineate contamination. These methods are recommended to allow for real-time decision making, the delineation of groundwater contamination in as few phases as possible, and the design of an effective remedial action. A lot of material. Go ahead, next one. Am I doing this? I don't know what I'm doing. Go back. Sorry. Yeah, that's it. Sorry about that. A lot of material in the groundwater guidance document is derived from the groundwater requirements in the current tech reg. The guidance document provides direction on performing groundwater remediation through all phases and is more detailed than the requirements in the existing tech rule. The proposed technical requirements are goal-oriented. For example, one of the goals in the groundwater remedial investigation is to complete delineation. The groundwater document provides guidance on methods for delineating groundwater contamination. Another example of this requirement is to perform a groundwater site investigation. Next slide, please. There were some that thought that the old rule was too prescriptive. This is 3.7a. This is the requirement to collect a groundwater sample. And it goes on. Next slide. And it goes on. And it goes on. I don't know why people thought this was too prescriptive. Next slide, please. It goes into 4.4. Next slide. Next. Next. And this is the new rule. This is the proposed rule. I'm sorry. Basically, the proposed rule says if there's a potential that groundwater was contaminated at your site, you need to conduct groundwater sampling. Next slide. In this case, the purpose of the guidance is to provide direction on determining if there's a potential that groundwater is contaminated. The proposed tech rule requires groundwater sampling at each AOC where there's a potential that groundwater has been contaminated. The guidance outlines issues to consider in making this determination. Next slide, please. I'm sorry, we're back a few. <laughs> okay, so the Groundwater Guidance Committee developed several issues to consider when determining if there's a potential that an AOC impacted groundwater. These include the presence of nearby impacted receptors. For example, if there's a well impacted near your site with contaminants that may have been discharged at your site, the presence of free or residual product detected in soil. Next slide. This is it. I'm sorry. The discharge, if a discharge is located near the water table or the AOC was designed to discharge directly to the water, groundwater, such as a septic, uh, if soil contamination is detected close to the water table, obviously. And based on contaminant and soil transport properties, and an estimated date of discharge determine if contamination has had time to migrate through the Vado zone to the water table. Should also consider for older discharges that mobile and volatile contaminants may no longer be present in the unsaturated zone since they may have migrated to the water table and volatilized from the unsaturated zone. In all these cases there's a potential that groundwater has been impacted and groundwater sampling must be conducted in accordance with the proposed technical requirements. Thank you. Next up is uh, George to introduce the next speaker. Uh, Christina Page of the Bureau of Inspection and Review. Okay, I want to make sure everyone can hear me. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Christina Page. Excuse me. This part of the presentation covers the site investigation portion of the groundwater guidance document. As Bill said, the purpose of the guidance is to provide direction on determining if there's a potential that groundwater has been impacted. Nothing in my presentation is really new information to anyone here, I think. It's been pulled out of regulation into guidance and it's for the use of the environmental community. So after identifying areas of concern during the preliminary assessment, the investigator must determine if a groundwater site investigation is required, and if so, how to conduct it. 
This presentation addresses the groundwater remediation standards and how to conduct a site investigation. Uh, lastly, this section of the guidance document provides guidance on background groundwater quality investigations. During the site investigation, contaminants may be identified in groundwater and may not have been discharged due to site operations. In this case, a background groundwater investigation may be considered to demonstrate that there is contribution from an off-site source. Next slide. As outlined in the proposed tech regs, the purpose of a site investigation is to determine if remediation is necessary because contaminants are present at the site or area of concern or because contaminants have emanated or are emanating from the site or area of concern and levels are above any of the applicable remediation standards or criterion. Next slide. The remediation standards establish the groundwater quality standards as the minimum standards. The groundwater quality standards identify three major groundwater designations in the state. The purpose of the site investigation is to determine if there is contamination above the standards. If contamination is identified during the site investigation, conduct the remedial investigation and delineate to the applicable groundwater remediation standard. Next slide. If a site investigation is required or considered necessary, begin to put together the plan for the site investigation. This includes where to sample, how many samples to collect, and what may be the best way to collect the data, like temporary points versus permanent monitoring wells. During this phase and all phases of the investigation, it's important to remember to minimize cross-contamination by avoiding drilling through heavily contaminated zones. Don't make the situation worse during the site investigation. This area of concern can be delineated after more, more is known about the source and the geology. Next slide. Something I'm going to say frequently today, and this is really hard to do because it's like a tongue twister and my mouth is really dry, is that site investigation sampling locations must be biased to the suspected location of greatest contamination. When developing a work plan for the site investigation, consider the type of contaminant that was potentially discharged. Is it mobile? Is it volatile? Is it a denapple contaminant? The history of the area of concern. This would have been obtained during the preliminary assessment while doing diligent inquiry into the site. The location of the discharge. Was it a surface or a subsurface spill? Can you estimate the depth of the release? Was there evidence of a discharge observed during coring? Did you see any staining or smell any odor? Were there elevated PID or FID readings? and then consider the age of the discharge. For example, if the PA identified a suspected PCE discharge 20 years ago, would you expect to see the highest concentrations at the water table or at depth today? Next slide, please. If it's determined that groundwater samples cannot be biased to the location of greatest suspected contamination, they should be collected as close to the area of concern as practical in, an, in a location that's hydraulically down gradient. To identify a sampling location that is hydraulically down gradient, consider the following. Review of topographic maps, identify proximal surface water bodies, determine if there's pumping wells in the area, locate subsurface conduits if they exist, obtain any data from adjacent site, possibly through a file review or other means you may have. For example, when I was a consultant, I worked for a firm uh, whose, um, whose clients were predominantly the major oil companies. Uh, often I was able to obtain groundwater flow from adjacent sites from data that we had in-house. And if a location down gradient cannot be determined, consider surrounding the area of concern with temporary points as close to the area of concern as practical. Next slide. When conducting the groundwater site investigation, it's useful to log cores at each sampling location. Obtaining this information during this phase of the investigation aids in the development of the conceptual hydrostratigraphic model, which would be finalized during the remedial investigation. For consistency, use one of the approved soil classification systems that are detailed in the Field Sampling Procedures Manual. Next slide. Excuse me for one second. If a discharge of l -Napple contaminants has occurred, screen the core through the water table to account for water table fluctuation and the possibility of contamination trapped beneath the water table. And again, bias to the location of greatest suspected contamination identified during field screening. Next slide. This is a cross-section showing laser-induced fluorescence results at a fuel discharge. 
The two black lines running horizontally in this image depict the seasonal high and low water table. The red and yellow color indicate residual product, which is present both above and below the water table. Keep in mind, all of the product may become trapped below the water table if the water table rises further above the product. Next slide. When conducting a site investigation of Dean Apple contaminants, consider the age of the discharge as evaluating soil cores below the water table to the first indication of contamination. For example, if you're in sand and encounter high instrument readings, collect a sample to confirm contamination. Or the first low permeability layer, like while coring, if no indication of contamination is observed, either visual, visually or by instrument readings, and then a low permeability layer is encountered, collect a sample to assess if there's contamination, or at the top of bedrock. If bedrock is encountered above the water table, then collect a sample in first groundwater to assess groundwater quality. Next slide. This slide demonstrates a discharge of Dean Apple contaminants in drilling in optimal weather conditions. The blue, the blue line running parallel represents the water table and the geology consists of sand with low permeability lenses. When coring, suspected contamination is identified by field instrumentation. Once contamination is con confirmed with laboratory data, this area of concern must be investigated during the remedial investigation. Next slide. This slide also demonstrates a Dean Apple discharge. Here's show, can you show the water table, uh, the sand, the low permeability layers, and the Dean Apple discharge. In this scenario, no instrument readings were detected, but a low permeability layer was encountered, so a sample would be collected. Once contamination is confirmed, further investigation must be conducted during the remedial investigation. Something to think about when conducting an investigation in either an L Apple or a Dean Apple discharge, um, it may not be where you think it is, so consider the age of the discharge um, and the heterogeneity of the subsurface. Next slide. The takeaway from this point, uh, this part of the presentation, is that whenever groundwater contamination is identified in the site investigation, move on to the next remedial phase, which is generally the remedial investigation. Um, this is an important stage of the investigation for use of professional judgment. Sometimes a single phase approach to remediation can be achieved, and this does occur at sites where source removal is conducted through excavation and groundwater is remediated as a result. Next slide. Okay, now I'm going to discuss the background groundwater quality section of our document. Next slide. So, why conduct a background groundwater quality investigation? Because pursuant to the Brownsfield Act, the person conducting remediation is not responsible to remediate contamination that is migrating on-site from an upgradient off-site source of contamination. Uh, when I say on-site while I'm giving this part of the presentation, I mean the site that you are the consultant or the LSRP for, and when I speak of off-site, I mean the upgradient off-site source. So determine if the contamination is from, off, from an off-site source or if it's from natural background. Next slide. The scope of a background groundwater investigation will be based on several factors. Expand or narrow the scope as necessary depending on the site complexity to meet the needs of the investigation on site. Understand if there's an on-site contribution. Was there an on-site discharge of a contaminant that's also migrating onto the site from an off-site source? And the technical outcome needs to be justifiable. Next slide. When planning the scope of a background investigation, consider the on-site complexity relative to the off-site source and the contaminants of concern. Multiple sampling points, multiple sampling events, and multiple water-bearing zones may be needed. For example, a Dean Apple investigation in bedrock might require more investigation versus a BTEX plume in the Cohansi where one sampling round may be sufficient. The analysis during the investigation should be based on what was discharged off-site as well as what is on site. If there is a known PCE discharge, consider analysis for the full suite of volatile organics to account for daughter products that could be detected. The data should support the conclusion. Was on site and off site data collected concurrently? How can additional data support the investigation? Additional sampling rounds may identify 
seasonal groundwater quality variations, and long-term groundwater quality trends. Next slide. Understand the on-site contribution. If a comprehensive PA was conducted on-site, was an on-site contribution identified? And if so, is the discharge quantifiable, or can the length of time the contaminant was discharged be estimated? By delineating your source area, you will have a greater understanding of what the on-site contribution is. Next slide. DEP recognizes that your role has changed. The department is no longer driving the outcome of determining upgrading off-site sources. The LSRP is now the decision maker. With that in mind, when conducting a background investigation, confirmed contamination is migrating on-site from an off-site source and be prepared to technically justify the conclusions of your investigation. The off-site property owner may hire a licensed site remediation professional to scrutinize your data and your conclusions. Working in the current bureau I work in, I've already seen this happen. Next slide. No further groundwater remediation is necessary when the contaminant or the contaminant's parent chemical has never been used on the site. There is no evidence of any other on-site discharge of the contaminant in question. The contaminant present is in the background samples. If these are the conditions related to your site, a CEA is not required. However, call the hotline to report the off-site discharge because in the future, when you submit an RAO, you need the incident number for the off-site contamination. And again, as a reviewer, I have had seen this happen. It's a mistake that I've seen a lot of LSRPs make. They're just not either calling in the incident number or omitting that information from the RAO entirely. Next slide. If there has been a site-related discharge, no further groundwater remediation is necessary when all site-related contamination associated with the AOC has been remediated and contaminant concentrations are greater in the upgradient groundwater. Next slide. Further remediation is required when there has been a site-related discharge and on-site groundwater contaminant concentrations are greater than concentrations coming onto the site. Next slide. The groundwater remediation standard for where there is an off-site contribution is the higher of the groundwater quality standard for the contaminant or the background concentration of the contaminant. Next slide. For contamination that is coming onto your site, the background concentration is your current cleanup goal. When conducting a background investigation, consider that background concentrations may change over time. For example, if the upgradient property owner has an additional discharge or remediates their discharge. Background contaminant concentrations may need to be reevaluated at a regular frequency and based upon that, the site-specific groundwater remediation goal may need to be revised. If the contamination identified at the site is believed to be from natural background, the supporting information should include the composition of the formation. For, for instance, arsenic is typically detected in the gluconitic soils in the Marlton area, or data that indicates that constituent distribution is consistent across the site, and that there are no elevated levels of contamination for the constituent of concern at any of the areas of concern. This slide, um, yep, thanks, Paul. This slide sums up the requirements uh, when dealing with natural background. If no discharge of contamination has, recurred, has occurred, remediation is complete, and no CEA is required for the naturally occurring constituent. An example is the, of this is the TAL metals that are naturally occur, due to naturally occurring conditions like aluminum, iron, manganese, silver, and sodium. However, if a discharge has occurred, remediate the discharge, establish a CEA, and obtain a groundwater remediation permit. Uh, that's all I have, and our next presenter is Jeff Farrell. Good afternoon. Today I'll be talking about the sources of groundwater contamination and NAPL. Uh, next slide, please. The um, 
This section of guidance basically is going to address uh, contamination and sources that are found in both uh, saturated and unsaturated zones, as well as any free phase or non-aqueous phase um, liquid that you may encounter in either the uh, residual, the saturated zone or unsaturated zone. Next slide. The triggers for groundwater investigation are defined in 726E, and they basically identify four triggers that are listed here. Next slide. The, a reminder is, is due here that if you do find NAPL, that, uh, I'm sorry, if NAPL is identified, your first priority is to identify and an interim remedial measure necessary to contain or remediate the NAPL. And if it is an LNAPL, you need to follow the uh, NJDEP guidance for um, free product interim remedial measures guidance. Next slide. So the delineation process and source identification, the first thing you want to do is take a look at what you know is your hydrogeologic framework and see how the, um, take that in your conceptual model and see how that affects what you, um, where contaminants may have gone. The potential sources could be from soil impacts, could be from dissolved constituents both that, that occur both horizontally and vertically. And you're going to, tr your responsibility is to basically delineate those sources in, that, in those soil impacts, as well as if found, again, address any NAPL that may be there. Next slide. In the unsaturated zone, you're going to be looking at whether soil constituents are leaching into the groundwater. And again, you want to assess and develop a, um, if you do have leaching in there, you want to assess the potential that um, the impact of groundwater criteria that is there. The, Impact to groundwater criteria that the DEP has established is very conservative. So you want to take a look at either the soil water partition equation, the SPLP with spreadsheet, the CESL model, and the CESL model with AT123D. The NJDEP website does have each, uh, has a um, guidance for use of each of these uh, models. Next slide. Saturated zone sources basically will be constituents leaching into the groundwater, NAPL or residual NAPL, and then there's also source zone non-NAPL layers, which I'll explain a bit more uh, later on. Next slide, please. So how are the source areas detected? The, the, there are various methods that have been developed over time that have been proven successful in, in defining source areas. The success of any methodology will depend on several factors. A good conceptual model that, is, that incorporates your geology, lithology, the degree of consolidation, as well as the depth of groundwater and, and NAPL composition should help you in selecting an appropriate methodology that, that uh, is proven. Next. Soil gas surveys. Uh, are useful for screening for LNAPL plumes and DNAPL release locations or dissolved constituent source areas. Uh, I had a client that we did a uh, soil gas survey for, and what we found was that there was an a unknown septic on site that had previously been used to, to hold um, uh, industrial waste. And when we opened up the septic, it was still full. And the client had been there for 30 years and never was aware of that that septic being there. So the, that is a good use of soil gas surveys. Obviously, the constraints for soil gas surveys are, are if you have low permeability soils or your saturated soils, uh, if you have saturated soils that are far from the, sur from the surface where the soil gas really is not going to see it very well. So when you look at the soil gas constraints, as I, as I mentioned, you have your unsaturated zone where you may have NAPL or other constituents that, that if your soil is tightly packed, there's not connectivity for that soil gas to get to the surface and be detected efficiently. The other 
situation that's a problem is uh, if you have water the, in the saturated zone where you have water, the napple may be trapped in that soil and again is not able to degas out into where it's recognizable uh, in a manner that's that's useful to you. Next slide. Direct push techniques such as membrane interface probes and cone penetrometers are very useful, uh, especially with a cone penetrometer. If you use the laser-induced fluorescence, they're, they're very helpful at identifying L apples. Geophysical techniques have been developed. There's the acoustic electrical resistance um, as well as electromagnetic. But there are significant constraints and uh, you know that some of the geophysical methods are not as cost effective, or at least for the sites that I've looked at, I haven't found them to be very useful because the expense of imp of deploying a, a geophysical technique versus the the assurance of my results have not been very helpful. I still need to go and do a direct push to to get confirmation. Next slide, please. So when you look at El Napple, you've got um, you're going to have your El Napal, you have a source area, it's going into through the unsaturated zone and migrating into your onto your water table and possibly depending on how the quantity of El Napal, it will go below. So you can see in the in the top cartoon that the migrating you have migrating El Napal. As you the source ceases, you still have mobile Napal that is moving from in the direction of groundwater, uh, groundwater flow. And then as you remove all of the napple that's there, you still will have a uh, residual L napple in both the saturated zone as well as the unsaturated zone. Next slide, please. In D napple, you, I have two cartoons, this one and the next one that I'll go through. You have the D napple entry point, and basically the, the D napple is going to tend to sink below the water table, and it will enter into, uh, it, if it's got a bedrock, you will enter into bedrock fractures that exist. Um, and it will, if you encounter a, a very um, tight zone, a clay, it will flow across that clay lens. And the next slide has a better example. Where you have the groundwater, uh, the, the tight deep sands and clays that are where the denapple pools on top of, and then depending on how much denapple is there, it can actually flow over into the next uh, tight zone and then onto the um, either a bedrock or a clay zone. Next slide. So again, when we look at the uh, the napple source comparison, you you will find in the unsaturated zone that the there is na that napple may occur as an adhesion to the particles and then as you get below the water table you still have those adhesion issues because of the uh, the napple isn't there isn't enough napple for it to migrate lower and the 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 actual particles are holding that napple next slide please the delineation process is a um, is an iterative process you want to evaluate as you go through what you've learned at each step. And you develop or modify your conceptual model. And you collect additional data. And you keep doing this until you're, you're complete. You've completed your delineation. Next slide, please. OK. Use the outside-in approach. You want to try to, to the extent possible, define an outside clean zone and move into your uh, impacted area. Uh, a lot of times what you think is a clean zone turns out to be not a clean zone and so you have to step out a little bit further. As data is known, you will refine your your approach. So I'm going to walk through a lot of times you'll get an end map where you have something like this, you have all these temporary well points that have been put in and you it looks like it was not done in a very methodical way. So we're going to step through this and see. Next slide. So we start out with a, uh, a tank that was removed, and there was some release. There were 
over excavation of the soil was done and you start out by putting in two temporary well points. The first temporary well point in the source area comes out clean, but the second one has a little uh, product in there. Next slide, please. So you want to delineate beyond that. So you've stepped out again and you now find that, frankly, uh, TWP5 has, has more impacts than was observed in two or four. Next slide. The, you step out again, you find your uh, impacted area again, step out. Uh, next slide, please. And the next slide. So you keep going out until you have your delineation done. Uh, next slide. Then you find out that, oh, yeah, the, at the old building, there was a tank that was removed a long time ago that uh, people had forgotten about. Next slide. When you put in what your plume looks like, you see that, that, that uh, it leads back to that second tank. Now, you're, what you want to, next slide. So you, you appear to have completed your groundwater delineation, but the question you should ask is, does, my da does the data that you have indicate that a NAPL exists? Next slide. You want to review your field data, and that's going to be field data from your temporary well points, any soil borings that may have been done. And you're specifically going to be looking at your visual observations as well as FID and PID. You may not initially have hydrophobic dyes and ultraviolet fluorescence, depending on whether you suspected uh, NAPL to have existed as you were going through. Next slide. The groundwater data, the, for DNAPLs, there's a 1% rule that's very, very helpful. And you want to take a look at um, the threshold DNAPL saturation calculation as well as the soil saturation limit for LNAPL and DNAPL. Next slide. So in this example, let's take a look at PCE. And you have a, an approximate pure phase solubility of 150 milligrams per liter with an effective solubility of 133 ppm. 1% of, of that solubility is 1.33 milligrams per liter, or 1330 ppb. So if your groundwater con concentration of PCE is greater than or equal to that concentration, then a Dean apple may be present on site. Next slide, please. So when you look at your data, you see that, uh, that three of your temporary well points, number 7, 11, and 15, have exceeded those areas. And so you do want to start looking to see if there was a Dean apple. Next slide. So the, the thing is that the, you have a lot of tools that you can use as you do your groundwater delineation that will help you identify both the source and delineate both your saturated zone and unsaturated zone impacts. You need to understand the tools and pick the right one so that you can save time and money. There are many references that we've included within the guidance, including the guidance, and they're out there to help you. Next slide. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. My name is Tom O'Brien. I'm the technical director at Active Environmental Technologies. If you flip through to the bottom slide, please. And I'm here to talk about groundwater remedial investigation and unconsolidated deposits in New Jersey. Today, I'm going to present a case study to walk you through how the guidance has been developed and the strategies that we will implement to understand the guidance. My plan is that you will walk away today with some helpful tools to help you do your job as an LSRP. Today, many of us are assigned to new projects uh, that we are not involved with in the past. Existing data exist, and we'll walk you through some of the challenges associated with those. Next slide, please. The old days. Flip, please. We used to locate wells with uh, dowsing methodologies. Uh, we have stopped that. Um, many geologists think you need to map the bedrock by sliding down a fracture plane. You want to know the depth to groundwater, you get a tech with a hard hat and a light, and you let her go down and find it. 
And the models themselves were pretty elementary in the beginning. Precipitation, runoff, recharge. And that was about the extent of the models in the old days. Next slide, please. The technical regulations are the reasons why we have to do a remedial investigation. You have to click through. I have like animation going on. Basically, when you have groundwater contamination, you need to do a remedial investigation. Or when there's a potential for groundwater contamination, you need to do a remedial investigation. Next slide, please. What's the purpose uh, of this remedial investigation? The guidance is in Chapter 3. It's been developed over a two-year period by the team. We've been working together, fine-tuning our plan, answering your questions, and responding to various inputs from different parties. We basically want to identify where the contamination is, where it's going, what its mobility is, and how to monitor it and remediate it. Next slide, please. The key to any remedial investigation, you're going to have to click that again, is a hydrogeologic model. We've talked about that today a bit. It's detailed in the guidance. It gives you some really good ideas and tools. Today, we'll uh, provide you with one example from a case study that I've completed. Here's what's happening. Our 3D capabilities are getting better and better. Uh, each of these uh, software packages that we develop are able to give us some really good ideas about what the subsurface conditions look like. Here's a multiple aquifer system where they're recovering uranium through an extraction well and injecting chemicals to stabilize the uranium while at the same time monitoring the groundwater in the two uh, sand deposits. Next slide, please. Okay, how do we start a conceptual model? Some of this may sound basic, but it's always good to get back to the basics. In New Jersey, many of the streams that we have are discharged groundwater zones. So we have our site located here. The possible direction of groundwater flow is towards the stream. So we have an idea which way groundwater will be flowing, what the impact areas might be. We also have tools today that identify the contaminated sources that are in the area. In this particular case, we have several, several upgrading sources of contamination to our property. We want to know where these contaminated sources are and also plan to do a background investigation very thoroughly in this particular case. Our receptors will be along those streets and it, obviously it will be to the surface water body. Next slide, please. When we look at a site, it's really important to evaluate where the operations were. This is our particular property. This will be our conceptual model today that we'll discuss. This is a former manufacturing facility that used TCE as a degreasing agent. The degreasing compounds were used in this building, and the flow of contamination is towards the stream. From the aerial, you can see that we have receptors of these homes. Uh, and upgrading, we talked about various sources including a railroad where there was a spill on numerous occasions on this particular rail line. We also have next door that also was a known contaminated site. And we now need to figure out what we want to do with respect to the remediation of this property and a proper evaluation of the contaminant transport. Next slide, please. All right, we back up. Again, basics, basics, basics. In New Jersey, there are basically four types of unconsolidated deposits. We have the coastal and beach deposits. We have our more complicated glacial deposits in northern New Jersey. We have residual soils that can be saturated above the bedrock. And then sometimes we have rock that's so fractured that it acts as an unconsolidated deposit in itself. Our guidance has been really upgraded this time. It includes actual reference sections for each of these units. So you can go to glacial deposits, and there'll be a glacial deposit section, and it'll give you all the references for the glacial deposits in the reference guide. Next slide, please. Can you see the profile of the old man in New Jersey? There's his hat. There's his eye. There's his nose, his mouth, and his ear. And from the neck down, 
is more simplified deposits. Those are the unconsolidated deposits. We have basically combinations of sand and clay and more complicated geology uh, in the head section of the state. That's where a lot of the investigations become more complicated. That's where the LSRP is more challenged. And some of our findings may be questioned by L other LSRPs. The glacial deposits could be outwash, lacustrians, the residuals, as I discussed. But knowing where you are in the state of New Jersey is real important with respect to your conceptual model. Back to the basics. Our particular site is in Mount Holly that we'll be talking about. So it'll be in the unconsolidated deposits of the intercoastal plain. Next slide, please. Here's a glacial hydrogeologic model uh, that was developed from one of the guidance seminars that the state of New Jersey gives. It actually is a very, very good, worthwhile uh, presentation. Uh, you should all consider it. The one thing I'd like to point out here is glacial till exist in New Jersey probably in 20% of the state. This unit has been undefined in several instances. Many people believe they can use a geoprobe, a direct push, to identify glacial till. They can't. They hit refusal. They call it bedrock. Now they think they're within two feet of the bedrock or at the bedrock, and now they think they need a remedial investigation for groundwater when in fact they had 100 feet of glacial till overlying bedrock. The glacial till being so dense and hard that the contamination was limited and the client then spent a lot of money and a lot of documentation to prove something that should have been done up front. More appropriate would have been to use mud rotary drilling where continuous split spoon samples were taken, the hole was advanced, and when you actually hit the rock, core the rock, prove that it's rock, is it the right kind of rock? Uh, I've cored a 10-foot boulder, and it was an igneous, and it's supposed to be a sedimentary deposit. So there I am, like, am I in rock? It can be very deceiving. It's an area where we're going to get in trouble. We need to watch out for this and to explore this more thoroughly than we have in the past. Next slide, please. This is a regolith. I'm going to use this uh, as part of a understanding of the mass of contaminants. Many times we're not thinking about the mass. Got mass removed. Mass, mass, mass. Got to get rid of the mass. It's important to get rid of it. In a regional lift model, they're identifying that 50% has water storing capability in this unit. What happens is if it can store water, it can store contamination for an elm apple, for example. So the mass is going to be in the upper part of the soil. So removing that mass by excavation may be a prudent concept. However, if you have a Dean apple, you flip the cone over, and we'll have more mass in depth. It may accumulate into fractures, with Andy will be speaking about in further discussions. So yeah, think about the mass in your conceptual model. It's not just, oh, here's the geology units. It's like, what is the contamination? What are the concentrations of the contamination? What's the mobility of the contaminant? Where's it at? Where's it hung up? And can I get it? Next slide, please. Sometimes you need immediate action. You're going to have to click through these. I have it animated. This particular site, potable well, free product. Basement sump, free product. Vapors in the house were outrageous. They couldn't live in the house. They moved out. We had a situation. You're going to have to flip through these. There you go. And the bedrock was grossly contaminated. We found out that we had rippable bedrock. The contamination was here, running right into the house. We immediately mobilized. We excavated the contaminated soil and the fractured rock that was contaminated. We removed it down to a depth where it wasn't contaminated. And this particular immediate action resulted actually in closure and an RAO for the property in today's terms. Next slide, please. The triad approach. Bill told me how to read this, so I'm going to read it to you. The, the triad approach is a process that integrates a systematic planning, dynamic work plans, and real-time measurements to achieve more timely and cost-effective site characterization and cleanup. Next slide, please. All right, here's something that you're not going to read in the guidance. 
we have these clients, they hire us, they expect us to be experts. They expect us to understand the process at the state. They expect us to be able to identify all their AOCs. They expect us to give them a price to identify all those AOCs. They expect us to be able to develop a remedial investigation. In this particular case, this is going to be a TC project that we talked about earlier, where the remedial investigation of groundwater became paramount. We had to run a pilot test for a plan that we had to remediate the site. Had to give them some numbers on that. We needed to develop a full-scale treatment system. Had to give them numbers on that. And then we also needed to close the site. You'll notice that change orders are important. Clients don't always understand like your original dollar value is 854000 and now you need another twenty. That's why it's an iterative process. You need to keep the client in the loop. Make sure he's educated to the process that you're taking. Make sure he understands your limitations. You need to understand the schedule. Which of these tasks are linked? Which are the successors and predecessors? Where is your critical path for the project? What has to happen for the next phase to begin? And then also, how do you get out of the job? How do you close this project out? This is not a science study. This is an investigation to remediate somebody's problem for a fee in accordance with the guidance, in accordance with the regulations. A million dollars is a lot of money. We need to be prudent, and we need to be expert in what we're preparing for our clients. Next slide, please. All right, we got the initial hydrogeologic model. We got the basics down. Uh, what other data do I need? How much more do I have to spend? You know, what can I do to get this data? How do I identify that background condition? You saw all those stars earlier for all those other regional contaminated sources. What do I have to do to figure this thing out? Next slide, please. I needed to make sure that the existing wells installed by other were screened in the appropriate formations. I needed to make sure they had a screen interval at depth above a confining layer to identify the Dean apple, if present, or the concentration at depth. I needed to understand if there's any side gradient problems going on. I showed you the one site that was contaminated in the earlier slide. And I also need to know the downgrading conditions. Yeah, there were homes there. People lived there. We're talking TCEs, now i got a vapor problem. I need to figure out what I need to do to test these homes. I need to figure out how to keep the public safe, and I need to figure out how to do that in a practical manner. Next slide, please. We need to monitor the plume. We need to check the vertical gradients, horizontally understand things. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Okay, we're back to the same site. This was the area that they had used the TCE. This is the background area. We had the railroad. All those other contaminated sites were back here. We needed a good background study. Three well couplets were used. One immediately above the adjacent property owner. One immediately above our plume. And then one out here to just get an idea if something else was coming in from side gradient. We put five well couplets in the plume to identify its concentration, distribution, and extent. We understood side gradient conditions from two wells on this side. One was here, one was here. And we also identified the side gradient conditions here and here at the adjacent property, as well as the down gradient conditions by one, two, three, four more well couplets. Many times, the maps that I review are only models associated with two-dimensional surface views. We're not looking in detail at the vertical distribution. We need to up our game in that area. I don't know how many reports I've looked at that do not contain any hydrogeologic cross-sections. I haven't seen a flow net since I drew one. And I haven't understood why people don't use structural contour maps for aquitards or other methods that we, we all know about and are contained in our new guidance. There are ways that uh, we can develop these tools and up our game and make our jobs a lot better. 
All right, so this is the same site. TCE is the big deal here. We understand that the uh, contamination is flowing towards the bottom of the page and discharging to this stream out here. Now we need to understand a little bit more of the vertical distribution of the contamination. Next slide, please. Okay. You heard earlier about all the techniques to use to evaluate the contamination, and they're all updated in guidance. They got some really cool stuff that came out that you know we may not be familiar with. I'm still old school. We use test pits to evaluate the film material on this job. It's a cross section. We identified the depth of the groundwater by shallow well. We identified the deeper groundwater condition from a deeper well couplet, just screened in the lower five feet. And we had this very, very good aquitard, Marshalltown. It was a very stiff, black, silty clay. Here's the other big problem that we're having is LSRPs. We forgot about how to classify soils. We present data that is unuseful to our counterparts. This is Burmeister. Compact. It's important to know if it's compact or loose. Tan, color, fine to medium sand. Little means something. It actually means something. It's not just a little bit or it, it means like 20%, 30%. And then we also need to understand the properties of the aquifer by aquifer test. We determined it was 10 to the minus 4 centimeters per second for this particular unit. The Marshalltown Aquitard. It was consistent across the entire site. A Freedom of Information study indicated that it was over 45 feet thick on an adjacent contaminated property. I didn't have to drill through it, which was good. I didn't want to. I'd have to be double casing, triple casing wells, more expensive cured. I did take Shelby tube samples of the clay, check for vertical permeability. The key here is the primary contaminant migration pathway against this clay layer is vertical. It's not horizontal. A lot of times we're figuring, oh, we've got a horizontal permeability that's in play here. It's really not. It's the least permeable layer in this unit will determine the vertical component of flow. So here we are. We have a 10 to the minus 7 centimeter per second aquitard. We sampled into it around 10 feet. Up near the surface, we have no TCE in it. And I also had existing wells. So what am I going to do now? How can I use these wells to figure out what's going on? Some people don't like geophysics. I love geophysics. Gamma logging is so cool. Sand is such an easy cut. Hardly any radioactivity in sand. As soon as you hit that clay, it runs right out like crazy. It's a, such a beautiful break. The gamma logging encased holes is very effective at defining the subsurface conditions. And I used that for four wells that had been placed into it. I could actually find the precise location so I could screen my wells and also target my remediation. Other things that we did, well, Darcy's Law hasn't changed much. So we do a Darcy analysis. You want to put a little retardation in there for the chemical, you can do that. And then you need to give them an idea of which way the groundwater is moving. Also drew a flow net, primarily a horizontal gradient, horizontal flow component, as well as the distribution of contaminants superimposed on the flow net. So here we have a very good hydrogeologic model, something that you could be proud of, something that you could use to determine what your next move might be, where you might be missing information. Maybe the state didn't like the fact, or you didn't like the fact that you didn't have more data in here. So you can go in and collect another two, prove that it's clean. Or maybe you needed another well up here to see if that background condition was indeed non-detect. This particular one didn't work out well for me. I, I put in Three well couplets upgraded, and they were all clean. Okay, I had all those sources. You know, I got an excited client. He's like, oh, wow, we may have another problem off-site. May not all be me. Unfortunately, it was all him. And uh, 
that's what happens sometimes. Um, next slide, please. Sentinel wells, really hard to get. You got to get people to agree to let you put them there. Um, this particular one was on a hill. Uh, this rig is out at max. It can't go up any higher. It's hanging in the air about three feet in the air. Uh, extra stabilizers, extra supports. And the discharge again in New Jersey, the river is where the groundwater is moving to. So you want to get near the river if you can to see if your site has gotten that far or to prove that, geez, you know, we haven't gotten that far. Helps you uh, develop your CEA, the distance that your CEA might need to be, and other factors associated with your contaminant migration and the pathways of migration. Next slide, please. All right. Does it make sense? Are the wells screened right? Did I do a cross-section perpendicular to groundwater flow to get contaminant migration? A lot of us sometimes don't understand it. The best cross-section lines are on contour for a seepage face to do flow and uh, calculate estimates for quantities of soil to be removed, and then vertically or perpendicular to contour to establish gradient distribution and extent in two dimensions. Next slide, please. Okay. Finally, we're, at, we're almost solved this problem. On to the next job, right? Here's our contaminated area. No contamination in the aquitard. Our receptor has been identified to be the stream. The contaminant breakdown from TC to PC is understood. We developed a proprietary approach to inject chemicals in the ground to break the bonds of the TC and PC and render it into ethene at the end of the uh, process. We put in a series of points in this area to inject chemicals. We put in a passive barrier and we injected down gradient. Process took about five months to get all these points in and get the chemicals into the ground. Some serious challenges when you're injecting, you don't want the stuff lying all over the ground surface. And it happens. Uh, a lot of times you need to cap the well point that you're injecting in or the rods, and you may need to have five or six of them set up so that the pressure can dissipate over time. Otherwise, your project gets delayed and is slowed down. This particular job is in the final stages. Uh, we identify what our limitations are. You can see that they are sometimes significant. Where I got my data, who drew the map, who flew the site, what data was collected when, what are the limitations of the data, etc. This project is an example that may be helpful to all of you, and I hope you found it quite informative. Thank you very much. Thanks, Tom. Actually, uh, right now is an opportunity to uh, ask the presenters thus far for uh, uh, questions. Uh, and again, uh, just to remind you, so that we do hear the question, please raise your hand. Neither Kathy or myself will run the, uh, the mic around to you. And uh, also, uh, if you can, direct uh, to the person if you have a specific question, that would also help. So uh, any questions uh, in the audience this afternoon? You guys are still awake, right? Oh, we got one behind you. Actually. Okay, yeah. Um, I guess both Christina and, uh, I'm sorry, Tom had mentioned soil uh, classifications. And it seems to me one of the guidance documents I read seemed to indicate that you were leaning towards USDA. I don't know whether that's true or not. Maybe somebody could comment on that. As opposed to Burmeister. Nope, you got to use a mic. The others. Thanks, buddy. I know that the uh, soil, the uh, impact to groundwater soil remediation standards use the USDA method. That's what they're comfortable. I like Burmester, but, you know, and that's in the field sampling procedures manual. You can use any of the ones that are in the field sampling procedures manual. No proposed changes. No, no. proposed changes. No. Yeah, the field sampling procedures manual is staying the same. Okay, another question? Two questions for Christine. Number one, you're talking about first groundwater in bedrock. How are you defining that? The definition that I understand in the DEP for bedrock well is you drill down 10 feet, fill it with concrete, case it, and then you drill down there, and that's your bedrock well. Is that what you're considering first water? 
uh, first groundwater and bedrock? No, in this in this case, you could you could you don't have to go into bedrock. If first bed if first water is in the upper bedrock zone, you can sample that groundwater in the upper bedrock zone. If I've got the uh, groundwater above bedrock, also. Yeah, if it's an indication that whether there is contaminant release there, absolutely. Okay. Second question with regard to reporting uh, contamination to the hotline, we're talking about. The, the issue of off-site the contamination. When a consultant finds contamination on the property, at what point, and he's not sure whether it's from that property or off-site, at what point is that consultant, or in this case the LSRP, required to call a hotline? The moment he finds contamination, or once he determines that the contamination is either from that site or from an upgrading site? It's not my area, but I would say that as soon as you know it's from an off-gradient site, site, up site, then you're responsible to call it in. As long as you still think it's from your site, you know, and you're, they have an LSRP, then I don't think you would have to call that in. Can't unless, be Kevin, that. unless Kevin thinks differently. <laughs> <laughs> it, it really depends. I mean, if you're investigating, you know, a, a gasoline discharge and you're looking for, for BTEX and you find BTEX in another well, I mean, that's related to that discharge that you already called into the hotline, hopefully. But if you identify TC or some other compound that's not related to the investigation, you need to call that in when you identify it. 